welcome back to episode 34 of Daily Drives, and today I'm talking about my deployment to Iraq. So, in the big lead up leading up to our deployment, we did about a nine month training cycle, ended off with uh, spending about a month out in California at NTC at Fort Irwin, which if you've never been out there, consider yourself lucky because <laughs> uh, I couldn't imagine being stationed there. But anyways, um, came back from that and went on uh, Christmas leave or Christmas vacation. Uh, and then as I came back from that, we got ready straight into our deployment. So the, the process of getting to Iraq um, is quite a, quite a journey in itself. So um, we were staying, again, we were coming out of Fort Hood. So uh, from Fort Hood, we went to flew to Maine, to Germany, then into Kuwait. Now once we got in Kuwait, there's a little bit of a layover while we were there. So we spent about three weeks in Kuwait doing final training and stuff like that. And then we uh, eventually got into Iraq. So the first base we went to in Iraq wasn't our final location. We, we started off in a little bit of a bigger base, uh, which a lot of people are stationed there, but our, our objective was to get to this uh, smaller, it's called patrol base, patrol base Minden. That was our eventual goal to get there. So uh, most of us were there for uh, about a week or so. Now we sent a, a early team into our, our final location because the, the, the camp was so small that they didn't have the, the, the resources and lodging available to house everyone that was originally there and then the people that were replacing it, which was us. So they spent, uh, sent about a four-man team in. Uh, I was part of that team, and during that that time that I was uh, there as that kind of that recon team, your whole goal is to figure out, you know, what they're doing, how they're doing it, uh, so we I can transfer that on to the rest of the guys when they got there. So they call it, I think they call it like left seat, right seat, but basically they. You're, you're shadowing them. They're going through their normal motions and routines and missions. And you're just along observing, figuring out again what, what they're doing so you can let your people know once everyone gets there. So we go through about a week of that. The rest of the people come in. Uh, they kind of trickle in over about a, a week or so. So uh, the main movement um, type for that was through a Black Hawk. So like eight of our guys get out of Black Hawk uh, helicopter would land uh, and then eight of their guys would immediately get on the helicopter once our guys were off uh, and they'd fly out. They did a few cycles of that until everyone from the old unit, uh, the guys we replaced were from 4th uh, Infantry Division out in Fort Carson in Colorado. Um, so they were leaving and then our guys all came in. Um, and so once we got there, we kind of got into the, the swing of things of how we were going to operate. We did a cycle so our primary mission while we were there it was during the final stages of the uh the drawdown that was happening in 2011 so the eventual goal was to train the the iraqi army and the police and make sure that they are competent enough that so we could hand over everything to them uh we'd head back to the states so we did that and kind of uh worked in a three-week cycle so week one where we would hold like a mini academy for the iraqi army and the iraqi police Week two, we would do um, we would do the base security. So they have uh, there were like four or five guard towers that were set up around the perimeter. You would do I think we did like eight or twelve hour cycles on that, which is miserable, especially if you're doing it at night. We we're just staring off in the desert uh, with your night vision on. But uh, you did a week doing that, and then the final week was doing missions. So you're going out, actually going to all these different uh, forts and stuff along the border or uh, doing like recon or surveillance missions or just going in the villages, talking with the, the elders and figuring out what's going on in the local area. So the, the actual area that we were in was, it was an interesting location due to its proximity to Iran. So there was a single road leading up to our base. And uh, if you want about a city block to the east of it, you were at the Iranian border. 
there's a border fort there with a, kind of like a traditional like uh, crossing between like the U.S. and, and uh, Mexico to where there's guards and stuff stationed there. Um, but outside of that, for the most part, it was just a berm that separated Iraq from the Iran. You certainly had to be um, paying attention to, to where you're at because uh, that definitely wouldn't be a good day if you just wandered into Iran by mistake. But they had guard towers and stuff set up there. Uh, it was a pretty clear visualization of, of where that border was. But again, we, we rotated on that cycle, that three-week cycle of training, security, and doing missions. And one of the good things about um, the deployment, the thing that the biggest thing that I took away from it um, was the, the, the sense of clarity and purpose that you have there. Because every day, your mission and your purpose is so clear. You know, you have a, you know, exactly what time you need to be somewhere, what you're going to be doing that day, and then how you know when once that mission or that objective is accomplished. So it's crystal clear, and that's one of the, the biggest things I took away. And I still kind of go back to that from time to time, to that level of purpose and mission that I had. And that's the whole reason for kind of creating this YouTube channel was so that I could help other people bring that that sense into their own lives. So um, again, that was that that was pr probably my biggest takeaway from it was that that clarity and mission purpose with it. Uh, now, for the most part, while we were in Iraq, it was miserable, especially with like the weather. Um, so we got there. I think we got into the country in February, and it wasn't too bad then. You know, it's maybe like 40s or 50s at at nighttime, and then there in the day it would heat up a little bit. But once you're there in the summer, you're talking about triple digits every single day. So 110, maybe even 120, um, depending on where you're at. You might also have a little bit of humidity with it there. And you got to think on top of that, we're wearing gear. So um, you're wearing, with all of your equipment and stuff like that, and your armor, about a 70-pound vest. You have your weapon, any other equipment like a radio um, or stuff you got to carry in a backpack with that there. So you have 100-plus pounds of gear. You're going around, you're just sweating your ass off uh, anytime you're, you're in that gear. But, uh, so we went through that cycle. Eventually, we ended up handing off the... Uh, the base to the Iraqis. That was funny. While we were there, we went through uh, a number of interpreters. One of the interpreters was actually uh, close to one of the close to my hometown. So he uh, he was from Dearborn in Michigan, uh, which has a large Arab population. Uh, super smart guy too. I mean, this, this dude spoke like five different languages, uh, but he was he was a really good interpreter because um, a lot of the times. Um, you don't know if, if the people you're talking to, like the, the local populace, uh, if they're lying or they're telling the truth. But he had been there for so long uh, doing this job and he, uh, he understood the culture and the language that he was able to tell us uh, when something might have been a little bit fishy and stuff like that. So, uh, But again, it was, it was cool seeing someone that was so close to my hometown uh, there. But anyways, uh, we go through that cycle. We end up handing off the base to the Iraqis. Um, and of course, we're not going to give them all of our gear, especially our stuff like our set that has, uh, you know, like classified material or stuff like that with it. So, what we couldn't take with us, we ended up just burning. There was this huge burn pit that we made, uh, giant bonfire for a few nights as we burned all that stuff, uh, and then we vacated. So we uh, handed everything off to the Iraqis. We loaded everything into our uh, our MRAPs and took off to the main base. Uh, and then from there we went on to uh, our follow-on mission. So our, our final few months there, we're at a, um, a joint forces base on the southernmost tip. And you want to talk about like hot in the summer? Like I imagine this is like Florida on steroids because you're, you're on the Gulf Coast. The temperatures are still 100 plus every day, and you're looking at 90, 95 percent humidity because the ocean is literally right there out, out your uh, your back door. To, uh, as a visualization but um so we spent a few months there we were just doing security for uh the the navy uh contractors or civilians they're working on uh some of the armored boats that the uh the u.s was working with them on uh we just did security for for those contractors that were charge of fixing it uh, and then it came back to the states so the uh coming back to the states was a process by itself probably a little bit uh more difficult yeah. 
a little bit more difficult than uh, coming there. Reason being is because um, just like as I got there, coming back, I got stuck in Kuwait, which I was not looking forward to. Uh, so you turn the majority of your gear in, you know, I didn't have my weapon anymore. Uh, anything else that I didn't have to turn in once I got back to the States, I pretty much loaded into a, uh, a Connex box there. But so I get to Kuwait and I'm not in charge of anyone anymore. I, I'm not running missions or security or stuff like that. My whole goal is just to get back to the state so I can sell, start out processing. Uh, and so every day you would go to a briefing and they would list off the names that were on the flight for the day. So uh, flights coming in and out were limited. And if you weren't on that flight, then you'd go back and the next day you show up hoping that your name was on there again. And it's a pretty quick process. Once your name was called, uh, you would go uh, give them your information and all that stuff. Your bags had to be packed. So pretty much every day your bags are packed, you're ready to go. You hear the list of names and then nothing happens. It's super, super demotivating, you know, going through this week after week. I felt like I was never going to leave Kuwait. Uh, eventually I did after about three weeks. The only good thing about being in Kuwait that long uh, not having anything to do was it gave me plenty of time to uh, work out, focus on fitness, uh, really just eat right. Because when we were at our uh, our other base, the the food that we had, they had they had a refrigerated Connex, uh, so it had to be either something that was you know pretty much everything you're eating there is highly processed because it has to be preserved and, and being able to endure those conditions. Uh, because you're not getting food chipped in every single week. So um, that was another big thing and a thing I, I really liked. Uh, instead of eating powdered eggs for however long that we did eat them, you know, you're eating uh, regular food, real eggs and uh, real vegetables and fruits and stuff like that. So that was the added benefit of uh, being in Kuwait. So anyways, I get back to the States eventually, uh, start my out processing. So I had to be in the States for uh, 60 days while you out process and all that stuff. So went through that and then got out. But again, uh, looking back at it, uh, biggest lesson I learned was to have that clarity and purpose. That's something I experienced every day firsthand. And it was, I mean, you feel so alive when you, you're actually living that type of life. Um, so if you're going to take one thing away from it, let it be that to find that clarity and that mission and that purpose in your own life, have something to work towards every single day and know when that objective or that task is complete uh, and then reflect on it at the end of the day and so keep making those little uh, micro steps forward. And that's how you're going to win at whatever it is you're going after.